On the 13th of June 1944, a new terror appeared in the skies of Britain. Its deep and deafening buzz was heard from miles away. The explosion killed eight innocent people. It was the first use of the V-1 flying bomb. It was the world's first ever operational cruise missile, and a weapon that's a hallmark of modern warfare, but built in the midst of the Second World War. The story of the flying bomb is as much a story about its engine, the infamous flame-spitting Pulse Jet. Pulse Jets are a old technology, with many patents appearing before the First World War. They work in a very simple way. A fuel is sprayed into the combustion chamber, where it's mixed with air. The mixture is lit, and the exhaust is used to create thrust. But for the Pulse Jet that powered the V1, we have to go to 1928 in a home in Munich. There lived an engineer, an inventor by the name of Paul Schmidt. He grew interested in Pulse Jets, and on his own time and money, he set off to make his own design. His innovation was a new intake valve, a grid of spring-loaded metal flaps that can be shut closed by the expanding gas in the combustion chamber, forcing more out of the thrust side, increasing efficiency. So he got to work completely unaware that he was crafting the instrument that in 16 years would play a tune of terror over London. The project would grow steadily over the years, resulting in troubled but promising prototypes. Schmidt and the other engineers working on the project could see its potential in disposable applications like target drones. And the new Nazi government agreed, giving research a second wind in 1934. In fact, just a year later, the first ever formal proposal of the flying bomb was made by Schmidt and fellow engineer Hans Maedelung. The Argus Motoring Company would be assigned to help with the development, bringing company engineer Fritz Goslau into the project. He proposed to the Nazi government a pulse jet powered long range radio controlled missile in 1939. Eventually Schmidt would be sidelined and development was handed over completely to the Argus Motoring Company under the control of Goslau. The final engine would be known as the Argus AS 109-014. It was little more than a tube with a spark plug on top. The valve grill sat at the intake and fuel nozzles poked through the valve grid to inject a mist of fuel into the combustion chamber. The valves were of a shutter design, simple, flexible, angled doors inside their tiny channels which would be opened by the airstream when the flow came from one side and shut when the flow came from the other. Behind the valve complex, the air and fuel mixed. Then it moved into the tube where it would be ignited by the spark plug. The gases gain momentum as they travel down the tube, so when they're expelled, they actually pull with them more gas than the fire created, making a low pressure inside the engine. This exhaust travels up the tube and meets the fresh batch of fuel and air, lighting it and restarting the cycle without the help of the spark plug. And so, with the Argus engine finished, the Fieseler Aircraft Manufacturing Company got tasked with making the airframe, while a third company named Ascania were tasked with the guidance system. The body was built out of simple steel sheets and the wings from plywood had no landing gear of any kind, so it had to be launched off steam ramps or deployed from a bomber. The V1 used three gyroscopes, a main one and two secondary ones to detect its orientation. They would control the servos, which in turn operated the tail of the aircraft, keeping it flying straight. Both the gyros and the servos were powered by compressed air stored in a pair of tanks in the middle of the fuselage. Half of this compressed air pressurized the fuel tank located further forward. This pressure fed the engine's fuel nozzles without the need for a pump. But in order to keep the V1 on target, blind gyroscopes weren't enough. So the Fiesler engineers equipped it with a magnetic compass on its nose. This compass was used for course corrections, left and right, keeping the missile heading towards a target. The mechanism to make the missile dive down into the target at the right time was even more crude. A little propeller on the nose of the bomb would spin in the wind, turning down a counter within the bomb. The counter activated a couple of things in the V1. First, it would arm the fuses in flight, but mainly it was used to set the duration of the flight. Once the counter reached zero, it would fire explosive bolts on the tail and release a tiny guillotine that severed the airlines to the servos. This would make the elevator go down, which tipped the nose of the missile immediately into a steep dive. The 850 kilogram warhead was set off by impact fuses. The first drafts of the aircraft were made in April 1942 and it began test flights in December of that same year under the utmost secrecy. Not too long after, the V1 was slated for mass production. 
This took place at a number of factories, often using forced labor. The most notable of these factories was Mittelwerk near Nordhausen, Germany, where slaves from concentration camps assembled the machines in cramped underground tunnels. They were given little to no food or protective equipment and absolutely no medical care. Over 20,000 people died in Mittelwerk alone more than the number of people killed by the V1 itself. When the first strikes in London happened, came as a complete shock to the British population, who were sure that the war in their skies had been won. Anti-aircraft crews were also caught unaware by the first attacks. They were warned of a new weapon, but they weren't prepared for its speed. Many of their guns were large and unwieldy, designed to fire at slow-moving bombers high in the sky. They couldn't cope with a speedy little aircraft zipping low over the ground. The anti-air weapons had their bases upgraded for fast traverse. Barrage balloons were put up which had steel cables designed to cut down any V1 that flew through them. But the most important defenses were the fighters. RAF pilots patrolled the skies day and night, pushing themselves to the limit to take down as many V1s as they could. For many pilots, the V1s were challenging targets as their high speed allowed them to outrun many fighters. Faster aircraft were soon brought in including the Allies' first jet fighter, the Gloucester Meteor. This would actually be how the first jet-on-jet -jet air kill in history occurred, when a Gloucester Meteor with jammed guns tipped over a V1. Later on, new inventions such as proximity fuse aircraft rounds and automatic aim using radar also helped strengthen London's defences drastically dropping the V1 success rate. The attacks over the British Isles lasted for nine months, from the 13th of June 1944 to the 27th of March 1945, during which more than 6,725 V1s were deployed against Britain, and 2,340 hit the capital, killing 5,475 people and injuring 16,000. But Britain was not the only target. As the Allies advanced through Europe, V1 attacks shifted to aim for cities of Antwerp, Brussels and others, with close to 30,000 V1 bombs manufactured during the war. Figures for total casualties are harder to pin down. So was it effective? Well, yes and no. It was unreliable, many never making it to their target. Every fifth V1 failed in the flight without any interference from the enemy. Their mission was also largely pointless. They couldn't aim for strategic targets, and they didn't try to. The goal was to break the morale of civilians, which thankfully did not happen. And yes, they were cheap, but even with their low cost, they were still a bigger burden on Germany's production capabilities than the countermeasures were for the Allies. That said, what was cost-effective was the Allied forces that had to divert significant portions of their defenses and dedicate large amounts of manpower to protect against the V1s. Had Germany not been in such a bad economic situation, they may have been a valuable addition to their arsenal. The United States clearly agreed as they hurriedly worked on a replica. It was called the Republic Ford JB-2. It proved better than the other designs of experimental cruise missiles developed in the US. It received a guidance system upgrade and was put into service with US top brass aspiring to have thousands built every day. However, problems shipping the bombs to the war meant they were never used. Still, they were the first cruise missiles pressed into service with the United States. Back with Germany, the V1 would see a new variant, the FI-103R Reichenberg. It was born out of desperation with the tides of war rapidly turning against the Reich. It was a suicide plane, meant for Japanese-style kamikaze attacks. German pilots weren't intended to die, but the disregard for their safety was total as they were asked to bail from the plane at the last second. This version was fortunately shelved. But the slow death of the V1 wasn't the end of the Reich's reign of terror over London. While the anti-air defences improved, the Germans prepared yet another revolutionary Wonderwaffe, capable of striking anywhere, at any time, with no warning.